15 to 16. And this is what the word of the Lord says. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evil doers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared God and esteemed his name. What we saw last week, the last time, that the book of Malachi speaks direct us, directly to us very, very much today. You see, believers in the days of the prophet Malachi got to face challenges of disappointment with the leaders that are around them and over them. They were also uh, were challenged with that big and great disruption of their worship. And also there was a growing coldness of heart towards the Lord their God in whom they claim to worship. But yet through all this, there was a group of believers who continue to remain faithful. And here Malachi describes them as a group of people who feared the Lord. And he tells us what they did, that those people who feared the Lord, well, those who feared the Lord, they spoke with each other. They gathered together. They encouraged each other. So when faithful believers, when we are challenged, when the culture around us is filled with skepticism, when the culture around us is filled with unbelief, well, as faithful believers, they move closer to each other. They learn to gather together and they learn to speak into each other's life. They learn to lift up another, one another. They, they, they seek to encourage each other and they do it as often as they could. And we saw that principle very well uh, illustrated on the road to Emmaus where this, when these two faithful disciples of God, well, they were talking together about Jesus as they were talking about Jesus, the Lord himself drew, drew near, drew close to them, and he walked with them. And we also find, and we will find that the presence of Jesus, we will find the presence of Jesus in the company of faithful and godly believers. This principle is mentioned by the Lord himself, where he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. So when we face when when we face what faithful believers in Malachi's face, what we ought to learn from them as we learn what to do, what they do, what those faithful believers do, and we if we do likewise, then we ourselves will not be found wanting. So we must not neglect the gathering of together, we must not neglect the speaking to each other the encouragement of each other, the uplifting of each other's life. And here Malachi tells us, See, then those who feared the Lord, they spoke with one another, and the Lord paid attention and heard them. That principle is always there in the Bible. The author of the book of Hebrews reminds us, he says this, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. God has never meant for us to be a lone ranger believer. God has always called us to be in community. In fact, one time there was someone who came to this great evangelist D.L. Moody and they were sitting together beside a fireplace. Uh, they're just beside a, a fire, a, bo a, a fire that's made of wood and all that. So this young believer spoke to this evangelist, hey, Dr. Moody, can a Christian be on his own? Without saying a word, D.L. Moody simply took a, tong, a pair of tongs, he put it into the fire, he took out a piece of burning wood and he just put it on the side, still in silence. After a while, it was very clear 
that a piece of wood, when it was taken out from the, from the fire, was burning hot. In a very short while, it began to die down and simmer down. He didn't even have to answer that question at all. God has meant for us to be encouraging each other by gathering together and speaking into each other's life. So we begin, and this evening, well, we continue this series that I've entitled, Be Encouraged. Last week, the first encouragement was that God hears. Well, this evening, we come to the second encouragement, which is God remembers. We begin at verse 13 in Malachi 3, here where God says, where the word says, God says to his people, Your words have been hard against us, against me, says the Lord. You have said, you have said, it is vain to serve God. Friends, sisters, if you have been a believer for a long time or for a while, you have been one person who has given of yourself to serve the Lord with all your heart, with all your zeal. You have given yourself, you have extended yourself in the serving of God. Well, we may come to a point or a time in our life where we will feel discouraged. There will come a time where we may feel totally defeated. And we realize that we are losing the zeal. We are losing the will to just to keep on going. The work that once began as a privilege, where we come with a privilege, now seems to be wearing out. It seems to become a liability. You've been giving of yourself, serving with love, giving of your time, giving of energy in serving the people of God, in serving the people at home, serving the people in your family, in serving your children, in serving your parents and all that. After a while, after a while, if nothing is happening, there comes a time where we may get discouraged. Why am I doing this? Why am I carrying this burden? Why do I have to face this all alone and all that? Why do I have to put up with ungrateful people? Why do I have to put up with unreasonable people? Why do I have to be given the response when I try to love? I'm given the coldness of the heart and all that. So sometimes in our service to the Lord, I'm not just talking about serving in church. The love that we, that we offer in serving those whom God has put around us, we keep on giving and giving and giving. Sometimes we may come to this point where we are tempted to say, in those dark moments, in those moments of discouragement, we would say it is really in vain to serve God. It happens to all people. It happens to faithful believers as well. Consider Asaph. Consider Asaph, the worship leader, the worship minister in the, in the Old Testament who wrote many psalms. Right? He's a godly man. He's a godly man in the Old Testament. And he struggled with this. He gave his heart to pursuing a holy life. He gave up his time to serve the Lord in a temple. But here he came to a time where in his own private thoughts, he says, in vain, in vain have I kept my heart clean. What is he saying? I've tried my best to walk with God. I've tried my best to live a life that honours God. And what have I gained? Why am I doing this in vain? Have I kept my heart clean? Now, if you read the rest of Psalms 73, you'll see how Asaph found the answers to those questions that he has. But my point in raising up Asaph is this. Here is a godly person in the Old Testament. He had those thoughts. Why am I doing this? What's the point that this faithful believer knew? He came to a point where he feel that pursuing a godly life, pursuing a life of serving the Lord might be in vain. And it's not just Asaph. We know of Job, right? He faced the same struggle. Last time we saw that he was commended for speaking well of God. Well, throughout the book of Job, I'm reading the, I just finished reading the book of Job in my Bible reading right now. You read through the book of Job, there are many things that he said that are not all that honorable to the Lord. In fact, he said that one time, right? He says, uh, he says, I'm a, he says that uh, 
Why have I served? Why do I labor? Am I working and working and working? There's nothing to show. What's the point? Is what he is saying. Same thing with the Apostle Paul in New Testament. He gave of his, of his life in planting of the churches, in building up of the churches. And one time in writing to the Galatian believers, he said this, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. Sometimes a pastor can feel that way, right? Any one of us who lead people, right, can feel that way. Any one of us who serve the people that God has put around us can feel this way. So if we have been tempted, right, to feel that our work, our service, our ministry, right, our serving of the people around us, our faithfulness, if we ever sense that they are wasted, well, Malachi 3 has a message for us. Because right here, God answers. God answers the charge that serving Him is in vain. So let's read what, what it says again. Malachi 3.16, it says here, Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before Him of those who feared the Lord and esteem His name. God is all-knowing. Does He need to have a book to remind Him of all that we have done? He doesn't. But you find that in Scripture, God always speaks in a way that we can understand. God doesn't need that book, but here Malachi tells us that God will never ever forget what those who fear Him have done done. That's a point that God wants us to receive this evening. So here we read of a book, right, written before God, written before God. Our first thought might be that this book, is that the book of life? And that is the book of life, the theme of the book of life is actually repeatedly spoken about in the Bible. Paul speaks of those whom he calls his fellow workers, those whose, whose name are in the book of life. When Jesus sent out disciples, when they came back, they were so excited, talking about demons, right, who, who were cast out and all that. Jesus said to his disciples, Rejoice that your name are written in heaven. You go to the book of Revelation, we are told that nothing unclean will ever enter God's new creation, but only those who, who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So this book of life belongs to Jesus. It is the Lamb's book of life. And who is Jesus? John tells us Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and it is He who gave us eternal life. So the names written in the book of life are the names of those who believe in Jesus. And it's by believing in Jesus that we have life. That's why our names are written in this book of life. So it is marvelous. It is marvelous to know that our name is written in the Lamb's book of life, isn't it? God says to His people, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Of millions and millions of people, God knows our name. He calls us by name. That's a very marvelous thought to behold. And this book of lamb, this this lamb's book of life was written before the foundation of the world. And God knows, God knows those who are his. He always has, he always will, and he will never ever forget his own. So if you think of it as a book of life, well, the book of life is a wonderful theme in the Bible. But I don't think, I don't think here Malachi is referring to that book of life. Because here Malachi is speaking, he's not talking about that. He says, a book of remembrance. That book is identified for us. It's not termed as a book of life. It's not termed as a Lamb's book of life. It is called a book of remembrance was written before the Lord. And this book of remembrance was written in response to the fear, right, of God's people that they may be serving Him in vain. 
So here is a different book. Dr. Walt Kaiser, he said this, here we see something similar to the Persian culture, the Persian custom of entering into a book, all acts that should be awarded in the future. There is such a book during that time in the Persian culture that records now all things that are done, right? That deserves to be rewarded or given an award sometime in the future. And this custom is not unknown to us. It is, has, it is also in the, in the Bible. If you are familiar with the book of Esther, Esther is a very interesting book. There's a fascinating re reference to this in the book of Esther. And the book of Esther is written about the same time as Nehemiah as well as Malachi. So those of us who are familiar with the book of Esther, well, who is Esther? Esther, in God's providence, she became the queen in the royal court of King Ahasuerus. And Esther had a cousin by the name of Mordecai. Mordecai was not just a good cousin. He was not just a good friend and a counsellor. Well, he was a good confidant. And he makes it a point to be near Esther. So he hangs around in the, near the palace quite often. So as the story goes, one day he was sitting in the, in the king's gates. And while sitting in the king's gate, he overheard two of the guards who came up with a plot to take the king's life. So when Esther heard of this plot, he quickly went to tell Esther. Esther went to warn the king and the plot did not happen. And the king's life was saved. So sometime later, right, there was a night. There was a night where the king couldn't sleep. He was turning and tossing and all that. And on that night where he couldn't sleep, well, he gave orders that he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And when that book of memorable deeds was, read, was being read before the king, he found out that sometime back, Mordecai was the one who gave the intelligence of this plot that was there to take his life. And so he asked, what honour? What honour has been done? What honour has been bestowed on Mordecai for what he did? And he was told, nothing has been done. So on hearing that, the king commanded that Mordecai should be honoured because he did what was written. In, because his, his name, what he did, his name and what he did was written in this book of memorable deeds. What's my point? The point is that in that time, during that time, well, the, 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 king, the king had a book of remembrance, a book where honourable deeds were recorded. And here Malachi tells us that God has a book of remembrance as well. So, brothers and sisters, if you are ever, ever tempted, and if you are ever discouraged, or when we start to think that perhaps our service to the Lord is in vain. Our service to the Lord in serving our family, in giving of our time, and giving of our, of our everything to our children or whatever. Our service in serving the people of God in the body of Christ. If we ever think that they are wasted, we are ones to know or we need to know that God remembers everything that we have done. It's recorded here. A book of remembrance was written before the Lord. The Lord remembers everything. What does the Lord remember? First of all, the Lord remember our work. Hebrews 6.10, one of my favourite verses in the Bible too. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. Perhaps some of us are facing circumstances or situations in our life where we feel that no one really cares about what we do. Worse, sometimes the thing that we do, we serve, we, we, really, we really do it with a heart of love, and we are misunderstood 
all together. That is even worse. Then we see, we ask, who sees? Who sees what we are doing? Who cares about what we are doing? Who knows? Who knows the sacrifice that we put in and all that? Well, the point here is God sees. God sees everything that we are doing. And here, God will not overlook what we do for Him. And this theme is written, is repeated in the words of Jesus to the churches in the book of Revelation. And this is what it says here. He says here, God knows our work. He says, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance. God knows the extent of the difficulty of our work. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty. And he says, I know where and I know where and I know where we dwell, he says. God knows all that goes into our work. He says, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance. God knows. People may not know. Our work may never attract the praise of someone. Our work may not appraise, may, may not even be, people are not even thankful for what we are doing for them. So what we do may not catch the attention of others, but you will, or it will be largely hidden from view. What we do, nobody knows. But here, God knows every of our work. Why? Because they are all, they are all written in this book of remembrance. So first of all, God remembers our work. Second thing, God remembers our words. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And the book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. See here, the book of remembrance was written before the Lord when God's people spoke with one another. When we esteem the Lord, right? When those who esteem God spoke together, God paid attention to what they speak. Which is why last week, I want to encourage all of us to be careful. To be careful when we gather. To be careful about what we speak with each other. Yes, there's a place for fun. Yes, there's a place for jokes. But if all the time that we do is just to slime each other and all that, well, that those are what is being recorded by the Lord. So we know that God hears hears us when we speak to Him. But that is not all that is said here. That's not what it is said here. It does not say that those who fear the Lord cry out to the Lord and the Lord heard them. That's not what this verse says. It says those who fear the Lord spoke with one another and the Lord heard them. So God hears every word that we speak or say to each other. So when we speak with each other with hope, in faith, we encourage each other with the word of the Lord. We, we speak courage to, to each other's life. We speak in a way that honors God. Well, Malachi tells us, the Lord heard them and the Lord remembers. So first, He remembers our works. Secondly, He remembers our words. What else does God remember? God remembers our tears. Psalms 56, it says, You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? See, God knows our highest hopes. At the same time, God knows our greatest fears as well. God knows the challenges that we are walking through. God knows the hardship that we are facing. God fully understands the struggles of our human heart. So on a night where out of all this, right, when you're tossing around, every turn on your bed, the heavenly book called one toss, one turn, two toss, two turns. It's a tick, 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 tick. Every one of them, God knows. And every tear that we cry, the people around us will know, right? Take a look at the person on the left. Take a look at the person on the right. Do you know when did they last cry? We may not know. Who understands the hardship 
that some of us are walking through, well, God knows. God knows. Every tear that ever rolled down our face, they are all in God's book of remembrance. So perhaps, as I said, we have endured that some we are enduring through a situation that no one else can understand. Others may not know the trouble that is in our heart. We shed our tears in the quietness of the toilet or in the darkness of your of your room. Well, your your pillow may have some records of how many tears, but God knows every tear that we cry. So may we be encouraged. May we be encouraged that God knows the pain that we carry because you remember our tears. The fourth, the fourth thing that God remembers, God remembers our desires. The psalmist says in Psalms 38, O oh Lord, all my longing is before you. My signing is not hidden from you. Every longing of our heart, God knows. Every disappointment, the signing of our hearts, He knows as well. I don't know about you. The longer I, I have been as a believer, as a child of God in my Christian life, I discover that many a times the desires of my heart goes beyond my own personal reach. How many times have I said, God, I wish to know you. As this Old Testament saying, Lord, I wish I'm like Moses, whom you speak face to face. Lord, I wish, I wish, I wish. Many of us have got great, noble, godly desires. But how many of us attain to those desires? Oftentimes, we don't, isn't it? Well, those desires are important to the Lord. The Lord looks at our heart, right? The Lord knows what we want to accomplish in our heart's desire, but yet the Lord understands that in our humanness, many a times our, our desire do not come to fulfillment, in a sense. Paul himself says this in Philippians. He says uh, to, the, to the Philippians, he says this, I want to know Christ, the power of His resurrection, not that I've already obtained it, but I press on. Here is a great godly saying in the New Testament. Right? He had great desires, but he knew and he knows and he knows in his heart that he just need to keep on pressing on and pressing on. So God knows what we want. And there is a wonderful encouragement. Because some of us in life, we may get we may have been disappointed. At some point you prayed for a certain door to be opened, for a certain thing that you want to do for God, but somehow it didn't turn out. Somehow, it didn't work out as we desire. So over time, we may have a sense of great discouragement. So all our desires, well, they are in God's book of remembrance. Even in the Old Testament, Solomon tells us that the Lord said this to, to King, to his father, King David. He says, Where else it is in your heart to build a house of my name, you did well that it was in your heart. King David had a desire, but he didn't get the opportunity because God's plan was not for King David to build that house. That opportunity and privilege was given to the son, but God remembers, God remembers that David had that desire. God doesn't forget. That's why the psalmist says, Oh Lord, all my longing is before you. So here's something to encourage all of us. Our work, our words, our tears, and all our godly desires are all written down in God's book of remembrance. All are recorded. None are forgotten. So what God remembers is a wonderful, wonderful encouragement for all of us who may at some point in our life feel a sense of this disappointment or discouragement. But I tell you what, what is even better is what God chooses not to remember. Right? So, there are other things, there are other things about us that are also written down. Mind you, 
The prophet Jeremiah says, in Jeremiah 17, he says this, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of diamond. It, it is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars. Here, Jeremiah tells us that our sins are also recorded. They are not written in pencil. Eh? They are not even written with ink. They are engraved with a pen of iron, chiseled out with a diamond point, worse than being tattooed, I believe. Deeply, deeply engraved. So our sins are written down. What are sins? What are the sins that are written down? Those small sins in our lives that we hardly can remember. Secret sins that you think no one knows what you did. Your own secret sins that we commit, you think no one knows. Well, they are written as well. Not only the small sins. If small sins are remembered, great sins are definitely remembered and not forgotten. All the sins that we committed every day, every month, every year, over the decades and all that, all of this, and it, as we live longer, that list just gets longer, isn't it? More and more pages added. So, but here is the wonderful, wonderful news of grace, of God's great grace and wonderful mercy. Right? In Jesus Christ, God remembers our works. He remembers our words. He remembers our tears. He remembers all our godly desires. But in Christ, God will not remember our sin. That is the beauty of it all. Jeremiah goes on to say in chapter 31, I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. Wow. How can God remember our sin no more when it is written in pen of iron, with a pen of iron? How can he ever forget that? Well, Colossians 2 tells us, when Jesus went to the cross, right, he cancelled the, the writing that stood against us. God forgave our sins by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The blood of Jesus is an eraser beyond comparison. And that is a, that the blood of Jesus is able to cleanse, to remove every of those small sins, of those hidden sins, of every great sins they have committed, consciously or unconsciously, deliberately or not, the blood of Jesus is able to cleanse and remove every of those sins, even though they have been recorded with pens of iron, chiseled into our hearts, isn't it? So the written charge, the sheet that contains all the charges of our sins, well, they are nailed on the cross. So when he was nailed to the cross, our sins were nailed there, nailed there with him. So when he hung there, he dealt with all that would rightly would have been charged to us. So in Jesus, God says to us, your sins and your iniquities, I will remember no more. Hallelujah should be our response, isn't it? So that's why God doesn't remember much better than what he remembers to be true. So out of this truth that God remembers all those good things about our life and that God chooses not to remember our sins against us, how then, how then should we respond? What should be some of our application? Let me suggest this to us. Let us use this truth to help us learn to treasure Jesus even more. See, how is it that a God who could remember our work, our words, our tears, our desires, that He will, he has chosen not to remember our sin? That is grace. That is love demonstrated. And it's because of His great mercy. 
that is found only in Jesus. So if you really would understand this truth and receive this truth, let us apply that. Let us, let us allow that to, to help us to learn to be more thankful for what God has done for us. And with that, let us learn to treasure, treasure His deep love for us. Let us learn to be thankful for His grace. But let us be even thankful for the mercy that He extends to us. For by His mercy, we are not consumed. We deserve it all. We deserve to be sent to the pit of hell. But here in His mercy, God doesn't send us to the pit of hell. So that should cause us to treasure Him on a daily basis. Once again, let's check the condition of our heart. How often, how often do we say thank, to say thank you? Thank you to the Lord for, for His love for us. How often do we thank God for His mercy that we are spared from what we rightly and fully deserve? A thankful heart is a true mark of godliness in my book. Secondly, let us use this to strengthen us in our service so that we are not discouraged, that we do not give up. Remember, Malachi says that a book of remembrance was written before the Lord and he says this in answer to God's people who at that time were so discouraged that they, they were saying it is vain, it is useless, it is pointless to serve the Lord. It is not vain to serve the Lord. And here's why a book of remembrance is written before Him. God remembers everything. Everything that we do out of a love for God in being expressed as a love for the people that God put around us. If we learn to, to love those who are our fellow church members, if we learn to encourage them, walk with them when they are discouraged, when they are down, when they are struggling, when we learn to serve our aging parents, giving up the things that we would rather, that, we, that, is, that is really a sacrifice, when we make sacrifice, sacrifices to serve those who are sick and ill, who are aged, when we make sacrifices for our children, the things that you give up for your children, the things that you do for your husband, the things that you do for your wife. The Lord remembers everything. Why? The Lord says, even, right, even a cup of cold water that is given in the name of Jesus, you will get your reward. Not that you are looking for rewards. I just want us not to be discouraged for to give it up altogether. Just keep on doing it because you are not doing it for that person you are serving. You are doing it for the Lord. In everything that we do, we are doing it as to the Lord and not for anything else. The people around us may disappoint us. In fact, they will disappoint us. But if our heart attitude is, whatever we do, I'm doing it for you, Lord. Right? Even if, if this person who I'm serving don't even care, don't even say thank you. It doesn't matter. Why? Because my heart attitude is I'm doing it for the Lord. And if you keep, if you keep that in focus, that should encourage us. That should strengthen our heart to keep on serving Him. That's how we should apply this truth. But the third thing we can do, use this to sustain us in patience. He says here, a book of remembrance was written before the Lord. The whole point, the whole point of this book of remembrance is that there will be a day where rewards will be given. Once again, it's not that you're serving because you want the reward, but the truth is that one day, all that is being done in the name of the Lord, we shall receive rewards. God does not promise immediate recognition or immediate reward for us in this world, but He tells us that He remembers. He remembers, right? In the book of Matthew chapter 6, three times it says, when you pray, when you give, your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you 
openly. So keep on serving the Lord. Keep on doing what the Lord has put on your heart so that it gives us a, set, a, a, a heart of endurance, a heart of great patience. So right now it's as if we are like servants who have been entrusted with a certain task. God is looking at us as servants of His. We are given certain tasks. Some are big, some are small, some short time, some a long time. And God is giving us those tasks to build us in our character, to see how we will respond to Him, respond to the task that is given to us. At the end of the day, all of us want to be found faithful, isn't it? God wants to, God will return one day and we are, we are given an account. This is a family that I have put before you to be loving, to be serving. This is a very unreasonable person, ungrateful person that I have made your brother, your sister, your husband or your wife. I put that person around you. How have you responded? All of us must be found at the end to be able to receive these words from the Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. It doesn't matter if that person doesn't respond in a godly manner. What is important is that I must be found responding in a godly way. Lord, is what you have given to me to form my character so that I can be more like Christ. You know, oftentimes we pray, right? Lord, give me patience. Teach me patience. And I want it now. Lord, I want to be more like Christ. And I want it now. See, patience is never given now. No. Patience will not, be, will, not be, will not be built into our life if that thing is given to us straight away. It may be days, weeks, months, or years. It may be no result. But if we keep on learning to trust the Lord in responding in a godly manner, believing that, Lord, what I'm doing in responding in a godly manner is so that I may be found faithful to what you have entrusted to me. That person may not respond accordingly. What is important? I want to be found by God's grace, with God's help, to be found faithful. Right? The Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy, Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who long for His appearing. So again, not we're looking for reward, but it is true. A day of great reward is coming. So as we look at that, to hear those beautiful words, good and faithful servant. That is what I want to hear at the end of my life. So that I can continue to pour my heart into what I sense God is entrusting me in this last leg of my life. Given a choice, there are many things I can be doing. But if God, this is what you're entrusting, entrusting to me, I want by your grace to be found faithful. Last but not least, right? Last but not least, let us use this truth to help us grow in grace. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world that really needs or desperately needs a great infusion of kindness. We, we live in a world that's in great need of forgiveness, of love, of grace, and of mercy. In a world where so many have become so used to thinking the worst of each other, let us not be like the world. Let us be godly. Here, here Paul says to Philippians, brothers, that includes sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, pure, lovely, commendable, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. We are called into the kingdom of God and it is a counter-culture. Do you want to live according to the principles of the kingdom? or don't live according to the principles of the world. We have that choice before us all the time. So if in a world where people are talking down to each other, discouraging each other, 
putting down each other and all that? Do we want to be flowing with the flow? That's not what it is. That's not what it is. In fact, this Puritan, Thomas, Thomas Watson, he shares about a story of Alexander the Great. The only thing I remember of the history lessons uh, of my primary school is Alexander the Great. So here, you know, I was, it was said that Alexander the Great has got an ugly scar. There's a scar on the side of his face. Alexander the Great has an ugly scar on the side of his face. So when he, was, when he asked for his portrait to be painted, right, the artist who was commissioned had him sit right, with his elbow on the table and his hand on the side of the scar so that that hand covers the ugly scar on the side of his face. That's what Thomas Watson tells us in his story. And it's what Thomas Watson says. He says, The painter who drew Alexander's picture drew him with his finger or his, or his hand upon the scar. And he drew that at the application. And he says, God puts a finger of mercy upon the scars of his children. God always look at us with a finger or with eyes of mercy. If we focus on all the bad things in our life without the hands of mercy, we are done. We are goners. So God always look at his people with eyes of mercy. So as that hand that covers the face of Alexander, right, the ugly scar on his face, God puts his hand or his finger of mercy on his children as well. Look at Sarah, Abraham's wife, right? At one point in the story, he laughed at God. He laughed at the promise. He laughed at what was being said in promise. But in the New Testament, right, when he's, when he's, when, when, when what they said about Sarah, all of Sarah's negative things were just passed over. And he was, she was commended for her gentle and quiet spirit. Look at Job. Job has said some terrible things. In the depth of his pain, he cursed the day that he was born. But we saw the last time at the end of the book of Job, well, God passes all the things that were said about him negatively and he commended Job for saying what was right. When Peter restored, when Jesus restores Peter, he makes no reference to his cursing or his denying. Instead, he simply asks Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then he says, feed my sheep. What is my point? In all of our lives, there are many things that are bad, that are negative, that are wrong, that are sinful. And if God chooses to just focus on all those bad things, we are all goners. But God chooses to look at us with mercy. Because that's good. That He remembers all our works, all our words, all our tears, all our desires, when God is so merciful that He chose us not to remember all our sin, then let us learn to take this truth and learn to treat people in the same way. God puts a finger of mercy on the scars of His children. His love covers a multitude of sin. If God remembers our works, our words, our tears and our desires, but chooses not to remember our sin, we can learn to do the same to others as well. That's a lesson that all of us need to learn. That's a lesson that I need to learn, right? I need to learn. Hazel always, remem always reminds me, people are having a tough time. People are having a rough life. Can you be a little more generous or not? People are doing their work. Can you be a little bit more gentle with that person on the other end of the phone? She's teaching me this truth, and it is a truth that I need to learn. 
that all of us need to learn because all the people around us will fail us. They will fail us big time at times. But we learn to give back, right? Good or bad. When people treat us wrongly, we choose to respond with grace, with forgiveness, with gentleness. When we do that, when we do that, well, you, you can't believe what God will do. So I'm learning. So let me encourage all of us. Can we all learn together? Let's do that. So those are some of the things that we can put in practice if we understand that here is such a God that we have. So can we pray together? Father, we have so much to learn about the love of God. We have so, so much to understand the extent of your love. Father, we have yet to fully understand that when Adam and Eve chose to rebel against us, against you, the whole of mankind is fully deserving of eternal damnation and be thrown into the pits of hell and would have fully deserved it with nothing to say. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will teach us to understand what this love of yours means to us. What you did on the cross, Lord, in extending grace, we don't deserve anything. But yet, Lord, you promise us everlasting life. Lord, we, disown, we don't deserve anything, but yet you call us into a wonderful, close and intimate relationship with you. That if we are willing and humble, we can know the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, you are deserving of all punishment, but yet, Lord, you took that punishment upon yourself when you sent Jesus to die on the cross. Teach us, Father. Teach us to understand the extent of your great mercy so that, Father, our hearts will always be overflowing with gratefulness and in sincere worship. So we thank you, Father, in this coming week as we walk towards Good Friday and into the joy of Easter. Continue to draw us to the cross of the Lord Jesus. Grant us quiet moments in these coming weeks that will reflect on what is done for us on the cross so that, Father, our heart would respond to you also with a heart of love and certainly with a heart of sincere worship. We thank you, we bless you, we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.